So I've been teaching a long time, and so almost everything I learn these days is learned in strong collaboration with my students. That's been particularly true of the material that I'm going to talk to you about tonight. So I'm going to be using two descriptive phrases this evening, which will be new to you. They'll be new to you because they're phrases my students and I have made up in order to deal with the things we have been studying. The first phrase is expressive culture. I use this phrase to describe all the material and conceptual things we create in order to make what is inside of our heads visible and understandable. It's a big category from stylish shoes to watercolors to games to comic strips to novels and beyond. So first, expressive culture. All the stuff we make and do in order to express ourselves. The second phrase is daily culture. I use daily culture to name the objects of expressive culture we make which are meant to be a part of our daily lives. That is, not the great American novel, but TV sitcom. Not Homer's Odyssey, but a single comic strip. I use the phrase daily culture instead of the phrase you have no doubt been using, popular culture. Because first, not all culture made for daily use turns out to be popular. And second, popular culture has a faint but detectable air of judgment around it. <laughs> popular culture tends to name things like the lowbrow or fun stuff, which you might like if you don't have very good taste. <laughs> so we're avoiding popular culture, and I want you to avoid it from this moment forward for the rest of your lives. <laughs> we're going to say instead daily culture, the culture we make for daily use. Daily storytelling, then, is storytelling which is meant to be consumed quickly, easily, every day. If we were to measure the importance or general social value of the various types of expressive culture by counting up how many of each there are, our daily stories would surely get way high up on our scales of value. Stories, as measured by amount, seem to be one of the most important things in our lives, right up there with air, food, and water. Just turn on the TV or open up the computer. Movies, TV shows, video games built on a narrative skeleton, novels, take just those things. And every minute of every day contains more examples than you can explore and understand in a lifetime. And we find daily storytelling in every human society that we know about. Of course, this counting way of measuring value or prestige produces a puzzle. Most of the time, and especially at college, daily culture and daily storytelling end up way at the bottom of our scales of value. To use an example, we will look at shortly comic strips, of which there are an almost uncountable many, tend to be located near the bottom of our scales of value. While well, something like James Joyce's Ulysses, which we'll also be thinking about in a minute, which is essentially a unique item, there's one of them, tends to be very high on our scale of value. Ulysses appears on many college syllabi. Comic strips essentially never appear in the classroom. I'm not going to ask you to be skeptical of the value we generally award to James Joyce's big book. Rather, I'm going to try and help you develop ways of thinking which might do justice to the actual lived value of the other stuff, the stuff low down on the scale. I guess I do want us all to confess how important daily storytelling is to us, but mostly I want to try to say why daily storytelling is so important, which means we need to think a little bit about what stories do for us, why we tell them. Our time is short. It's not class, so let's not spend time noodling and exploring this most interesting of issues. I'll just say why I think stories are so important, and we'll go on from there. Storytelling is our primary cognitive tool for imposing ourselves on the world. Or, we might say, storytelling keeps us from being imposed upon by the world. There are other ways of managing the overwhelming complexity of everyday experience, which we use all the time, pictures, memories, associations of the senses. But storytelling gives us power. Storytelling gives us mastery over the chaos of our experience. Stories attribute sense and meaning to our lives. By mastery, I mean the way stories arrange the overwhelming rush of life into ordered chains of cause and effect. I mean the way stories sort the interesting from the uninteresting. 
the relevant from the irrelevant. And perhaps, most importantly, I mean the way stories provide life with shape, with beginnings and ends, climaxes and transformations. I think, by the way, I think that there's not much difference from this point of view between the stories we tell about our actual days and stories we tell about the made-up days of made-up people. So with that in mind, let's explore the value of daily storytelling by taking a couple of examples and figuring out what these examples of expressive culture are doing for us, in what way they arrange and attribute meaning to human life. I have two examples, one of daily storytelling, one of non-daily storytelling. The daily storytelling example is from one of the longest continuous stories in American culture. One day of a comic strip called Gasoline Alley, which began around 1920 and is in fact still in progress today. My non-daily example I've already told you about is one of the most famous and imposing stories told in English in the 20th century. I have a picture of, and one page of, James Joyce's Ulysses. So, here's the comic strip. It appeared in many newspapers across the United States on February 2nd, 1922. Let's read it. In fact, it's the comic strip, so you don't have to really read the first two boxes. <laughs> the third box, the baby is called Skeezix, the man is called Walt, Walt Wallet. Why, you little rascal, I'll have to spank you if you don't do better than that. Skizix has pulled the phone off the, the uh, cupboard there. And then he realizes the operator heard him, and he said, no, operator, I wasn't speaking to you. <laughs> Here, by the way, is some of its environment. Um, this is the page on which it appeared in the Los Angeles Times. Lots is missing here. Uh, the rest of the newspaper, for instance. <laughs> Uh, and besides, they're just pictures. The physical object of the newspaper is also missing. I've chosen this day of this most distinguished of comic strips because it is the day that this book, James Joyce's Ulysses, was first published in Paris. So, here's a page from Ulysses. <laughs> Let's read it. <laughs> so I said, oh, anyway, so maybe it would work better. Let's read a sentence of it. So first, we'll have to find a mark of punctuation. I'm sure there's one. <laughs> Actually, I just, I guess, so. We clearly don't have time to deal with this. <laughs> so, of course, you see my point. This contrast in immediate clarity is the first and most central fact in comparing the work these two objects of expressive culture were designed to do. We should look at the contrast between them in a firm, analytic way, avoiding, as best we can, any kind of value judgment. The comic strip is designed to be consumed with the coffee. The big book is not. The big book is designed to have an entirely different place in the rhythm of culture. The big book is storytelling, but it isn't daily storytelling. It doesn't want to be. That's something that you know already. But we have to be sure to say it the other way around also. The comic strip is storytelling, but it doesn't want to be the kind of storytelling that Ulysses is. It is daily storytelling. A stronger way to put it is that the comic strip would be a failure if it was like this page from Ulysses. The comic strip isn't trying to do what Ulysses is trying to do. It's trying to do something else. Even if some exceptionally well-informed Parisian was thinking of reading both the comic strip and Ulysses over the café and the croissant before work one morning in the winter of 1922, it clearly just wouldn't have worked out. It's not humanly possible. <laughs> Even reading this page might be a little bit too much. You might be late for the bus if you try just this one page. And this page occurs very late in a very long book. If you were studying this book in an English class at Williams, you would have been through most of the semester before you even reached it. So what is Ulysses for? What is it designed to do that it turned out this way? Much to say on that subject, of course. Ulysses is long, but the talk about Ulysses is even longer. <laughs> so I'll jump to a descriptive end. I would call this the famous stream of consciousness, a form of hyperrealism. It's an attempt to mimic in storytelling the dense complexity of lived experience. 
as complex as it is, it is not as complex as you are. It's not as complex as even the accumulated experience we have had together in the last few minutes. No representation of the world comes close to reproducing the actual complexity of the world or the actual complexity of our inner lives. So it's right to say that Ulysses attempts to mimic in writing the complexity of lived experience. The process of understanding such an object of expressive culture is hard analytic work. We wrest meaning from such a book with great labor. And when we have done so, we have a feeling akin to that rarest of feelings, the feeling that we understand and are in control of our own lives. If we're interested in works like Ulysses and participate sympathetically in the experience they make possible, their complexity gives us something like practice in understanding the subtlest features of our world. They refuse to simplify works like Ulysses. They refuse to allow us to simplify. Works like Ulysses insist that our lives are complex and that we must win understanding carefully, thoughtfully, and fully. Even though it is very complex, because Ulysses is in fact less complex than we are and less complex than our lives, it is possible to understand Ulysses in ways that it is not possible to understand our lived experience. Because it is possible to understand works of expressive culture, because they are designs that we can enter into. Understanding books like Ulysses give us the feeling that we have understood deep parts of the life that they mimic. And so we love such things, we really do. Though our love from them is less familiar and less easygoing than our love for things like this. Almost everything about this comic strip is the opposite of Ulysses. Where Ulysses values complexity, Gasoline Alley values simplicity and clarity. Where Ulysses values slowness, density, and labor, Gasoline Alley values speed, openness, and ease. You can see how even the boxes themselves shoulder away the print on the page, how they seem to clear space on the page. Notice the beautiful expressive simplicity of the line drawing, which uses a minimum of ink for maximum pur purpose. If you were following this strip as we follow our favorite daily stories, you would need everything you, you would know, everything you know, need to know about Walt Wallet and Skeezix already. It would take you no time, and I think it's proper to say literally no time, to know who they are, to absorb that we're in their living room, which we visit often, you would recognize Walt's bathrobe. You would remember that Skeezix is about a year old. We've even seen the phone before. We see the phone quite frequently, actually. The characters in Gasoline Alley, by the way, age in real time. Skeezix arrived on Walt's doorstep in a basket on Valentine's Day, 1921. So we might call this a vignette, an emotional moment. It is a story with the tiniest, most understandable and quietest of rhythms. The tiny rise to the modest climax and the cheerful, just barely witty conclusion. <laughs> In this story, almost everything about life has been cleared away, gently pushed aside to make room for this compact little scene. Parenting, as many people in the room know, is a complicated business. Childhood, Troublesome. Disciplining children is a source of continual conflict in families and in our culture. Interactions with other people, which create the possibility of misunderstanding, those interactions produce anger and anxiety and endless conflict. Even aside from such things, our minds are so full of thought, so full of feelings at every moment that we can hardly keep track of ourselves. Here, in this world, which is entirely typical of the storytelling worlds of American domestic melodrama and comedy, all of that complexity has either been cleared away or represented in the simplest ways. In this tiny story, the complexity of fathering in interacting with others comes and goes with hardly a whisper. We understand the story totally. It presents a world which is more or less completely understandable. 
as in all serial or repeated story worlds, the characters and their setting are almost totally stable. We look for Walt and Skeezix as we turn the pages, and then there they are. With so much cleared away, and with this great conceptual stability, the drama the strip generates is clean and clear and immediately graspable. I'll confess that I think that the purpose of, of works of expressive culture is always to help us feel in some way more in control of the onrush of experience. So we shouldn't be surprised that Gasoline Alley is doing the same thing that Ulysses is doing, but it does it very differently. This comic strip produces a moment of reprieve from complexity, from the labor of making meaning. It presents a world which makes immediate, entirely clear sense. On that morning in February of 1922, you could have taken a small break in the clear, dramatic air of Gasoline Alley before beginning the hard labor of another day of being. You might have been refreshed. You might carry this easy model of fathering which recognizes, but is mostly tolerant of misbehavior, you might have carried that model with you into the business of your day. All good examples of daily storytelling shoulder away complexity in some way. Even those cop shows on television, with all their mayhem, create and present highly simplified, immediately graspable, understandable and predictable emotional worlds. And all good examples of daily storytelling, the ones we are devoted to, are about something. They have a subject which we find in some way compelling. Gasoline Alley, as my students and I have learned, turns out to be about love. It is about the simple but almost total importance of embracing others with generosity, with humor, with tolerance for their faults. So, there we are. Daily stories give us meaning as a gift, which we receive gratefully, if quickly, and almost without thought. Non-daily storytelling asks us to wrestle meaning from the story as practice for the daily wrestling of meaning from life itself. Perhaps we tend not to value our daily stories as highly as stories like Ulysses, because in some way we feel guilty for needing the dramatic simplification that daily stories provide. We feel guilty perhaps, for allowing ourselves these moments of reprieve from the density of our emotional lives. We shouldn't, though. We shouldn't feel guilty. We should simply know that we need daily stories and that we need complexity, too. These two kinds of stories are like different food groups, and a healthy diet of expressive culture includes them both. Thank you.